So welcome back to EJ Live. This is one of our short uh, snippet interviews. And I have with me Benedict Kingsbury, my colleague from NYU, and who also happens to be uh, one of the two editors in chief of uh, the American Journal of International Law, our elder brother. Now, you know, in the Bible, it's always the younger brother who's preferred. But uh, so I thought I would just take the opportunity and uh, everybody kind of having an interest in Agile Live would be interested to hear what your and Jose Alvarez's plans are for Agile. Yeah, well, of course, uh, we, we treat sisters and brothers as the same. Uh, <laughs> so, but I think we're very, very much uh, uh, tout ensemble and trying to do our best in the field of international law. Agile has been super exciting and we're doing what we can with Agile. Of course, it's uh, venerable and, and quite distinctively in the field and has been very much been connected with uh, the United States as an important part of the international law world and the world of international politics and governance. So. That connection is an important one, and we want to keep it as an American journal and not completely shift it to something which would be like a natural sciences journal for anyone anywhere. Um, th on the other hand, we are very keen to make it a journal which people around the world want to read, not just because of interest in what people in the United States are thinking, but because it's a world journal which caters to what people are interested in and has contributors from around the world and reviewers uh, and participants in the board and uh, other ways of people being really involved. So we've tried to do that uh, expansion of, of its involvement with people by uh, starting an online version called Agile Unbound, which has probably got 70 or 80 short papers now. We've tried various formats, and of course, Agile has been much, much longer online and spectacular leader in this. But we are, at the moment, I think, settled on a format of short essays up to 3,000 words and peer-reviewed, so they're not instant, not a blog, even though we used a blog format initially. And well, eventually those will be all, both HTML and PDF, uh, paginated for an annual uh, series, so they'll be citable and permanently there. Now, aim there is to be strong in scholarly terms, uh, current, but it could be pure theory, it could be something quite recent. Uh, Azel, the American Society of National Law publishes an insight series which covers important current developments in a more, this is what's happening kind of way. We're trying to be more of a journal, but with that more accessible format, we hope. And we have in there a commentary on articles and recent issues. People can respond in a lively way, but with not, not evanescent comments, but durable ones. So the peer review process applies to those. We have a committee of seven members of the board and a managing editor who's Harlan Cohen present. Uh, and we hope involving a lot of younger scholars uh, and very much aiming to bring in people from anywhere in the world who would like to write something. That's the spirit of it. So that's a, one direction, it's the one I'm very excited about. We're now trying to see if we can develop a, a stronger website for it to make it more accessible in the inspirational way that Egil has done. And I think we hope that website could also be a basis for expanding the long articles in the journal uh, over time. I mean, we would like to get towards some more open access material than we have. We're very conscious, as any publishing journal is now, that we write things about issues in all parts of the world, and it's difficult for lots of people to access those if they don't have a structure. We, it's not easy revenue-wise, but we'd like to move towards much more of that. We, I think, I hope to do more, which is more maybe cutting-edge theory, innovative ideas of some sort, uh, cross-disciplinary stuff more in a non-ponderous but robust way and also and when you say more would that be simply by way of indicating preferences to your potential authors of what you as editors would be interested in reviewing or actually being uh you know proactive uh, generated symposium commission pieces etc we're trying to do what we can to give a little bit of leadership and encourage focus in some scholarly areas that we think are a little neglected. We've tried to so we systematically study what we receive and there's a mis big mismatch between what seems to be intellectually exciting or important in the world uh, on the one hand and the, the focus of submissions we receive on the other, concentrated in a rather small number of areas of the submission. So we're trying to do some new things, one of which we're supporting is comparative international law, the field, and we've had one some physical meeting last year of some authors and we're reviewing a lot of manuscripts now in that area and we hope to get a whole symposium out with the idea of at least exploring whether the comparative international law idea has some traction 
we're doing something also on the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals as they wind down. As so these, these would be commission papers that you would actually turn to scholars and say write to it? Or are you aggregating things that people are submitting? Uh, the Yugoslav and Rwanda was a, a, a solicited individually by members of the board in, in an organized way. The Caparva International Law was asked a lot of people who might be interested. And we've also, when we receive a manuscript, we might write back to a person saying, well, this could be adaptable, or you might be interested in going in this direction. So it's a bit of a mix there, direct uh, sort of personal solicitation, a little bit open textured. And we're really keen on the call for papers method. At the moment, we're using that more for unbound, just because we have so little space. We could call for papers, but then we would be able to publish very many of them in, in the physical journal, but we hope the unbound is liberating us. Have you at all had any thoughts, because that's something that at EGIL, it's, we've been thinking about this every year, and we just keep uh, uh, beating our chests and going to and fro. Whether it have you had thoughts about abandoning the paper format altogether and only to be in digital format? One advantage being that the constraint on page number is a little bit loosened in that way. So Agile has uh, intensively professionally edited structures per page and we, we, we really wanted to keep something like that. And so even being purely online wouldn't save us a huge amount of money, but we would like to expand the scope of it because we receive much more good material than we can publish. We put a lot in, as EGIL and other journals do, to trying to make a lot of comments, even to many authors whose paper we can't accept, and also to working hard on papers we're trying to get over the line or trying to get to published points. So that also is a question of how much capacity we have to do that work, but our direction is that. We've expanded the size of the board. It's coming up to be 30 elected members in a fixed term and as well as the honorary senior people. So we're hoping we have more capacity to, to really for people to work on those things. I think uh, we all, we're very keen to do also more, which is of interest to practitioners. We're keen to find work, which is hard on, for example, how the US financial sanctions law really works in a nitty gritty way. And it's things which aren't doable from the desk of a scholar in a university and not just library materials, but which reflect close practice and we hope to start to influence it, not just report it. So we are trying to do some nudging and soliciting, we have to have space to publish those things when we get them. So the answers we've talked about going purely uh, online, we'd have to cut if a little bit the editing costs to expand a lot per page and we have a constituency of people who still want to read the physical journal and I suppose a lot of people feel like that especially a long established journal and I think I maybe do. I like it yeah me also another generation until we feel confident that uh, I like my paper edition of Agile and I like my paper edition of Agile too so just kind of uh, the the nice and not so nice parts of being editor-in-chief of a journal. What's the part you like most about your job as editor-in-chief and what's the part you like least? Well, most is the moments, which aren't so uh, common, where we can find a manuscript by a scholar not so well established uh, and which gets through the board re review process, which is quite robust and rejects quite a number of papers that I myself might want to might accept. Uh, gets one across that line and then it comes out in, into the world and people are excited about it, it's done something different. And that's it's a long gestation and it's hard sometimes to remember the moment when one was so surprised to read this manuscript, not knowing much about the author or the topic and there it's finally come out. But we've had some of that. We had a nice one on human trafficking, which has pushed in a new direction. Uh, the tougher moments, there's the odd well-established well person who's not happy if their paper isn't accepted and it's a little delicate handling some of those. I think Have you, I've once had somebody threatened to sue me for not publishing their paper. It actually happened. Has that happened to you? It is not. Uh, I, I think you've in a way set the benchmark for how to defend that kind of claim and maybe that'll be uh, discouraging. No, no, we haven't. Had, we actually have, we try to be very courteous. We also try very hard to be proactive and write helpful comments to people and explain things. We. It's not always maybe been true in the past. A journal with, which has so many hundreds of submissions, people haven't always had a capacity to write back with reasons. We've really tried. We don't always manage it. We really try hard to explain why we're doing what we're doing. And that, I think people feel better that there's a proper process and, uh, and some reasons, even if they don't. They, of course, most people don't see all the hundreds of manuscripts we're not able to publish. So in a way, it's hard for someone just thinking of theirs to know what would have been excluded had we put theirs in. But we, we know that. And that you know, we once a year publish our stats. Or vital statistics. We don't get numbers, but we give percentages so that people at least have a sense of 
uh, you, when we say there's too many good articles for us to be able to publish, they realize that it's not just a platitude, a kind of feel good. There really are too many good articles and other considerations uh, come into play. So you like that least, that's the that's kind of having to explain to people why they're not published. I'm glad to explain it. Uh, I, I don't sort of like the recriminations about or the sense that I've made a mistake, but of course you have to back your own judgment if you're in this business. And Jose Alvarez and I are very much together. We consult about every manuscript where there's any kind of question. And we have a rigorous process of having uh, at, at least two and often three readers before a paper's rejected uh, and a team of, to help us check again that we're not making mistakes or too late in the night missing something important. So we, we feel we've got enough in place that we're not making, we hope, foolish decisions. Mm -hmm. So you believe you're going to catch up to Agile someday? Uh, no, well, it's a long struggle, but it's, it, it's so exciting to be in a field where people keep moving. And uh, the, I think all of us are thinking, I meet lecturers in Khartoum whose students only read on a cell phone. They have no library access, really. And, uh, and we have to be moving both to cater to technologically to that and to provide content, which is interesting to people there. Oh, so yeah. we're, all of us are trying to do our best to move fast. You know that we've just launched our app, so we have now a, a, a tablet version of Egil. So we'll see if that takes off or doesn't. It's been great having Benedict Kingsbury, professor of international law at NYU, at uh, Utah. And, and Utah, and uh, one of the two editors in chief of Egil. Thanks for being with us. It's a joy to be uh, here again. Thanks.